Hello. Well, in the last video you saw us down on Southampton Water testing Woodstock and a catalogue of things went wrong. Um, in this video I'm just going to go through some of the results of our analysis of that trip and uh, tell you what we've uh, concluded about it and what we're going to do about it. So let's get on. Once we'd got over the problem with the fishermen's uh, lines, uh, the boat sailed like this, magenta being under radio control. Um, and these three sections of radio control, here, here and here, seemed to be going uh, correctly. But when we got to this section of radio control here, the radio control did not seem to be effective, judging by the video on the deck camera. Shortly before this, a big wave swept over the deck and completely drenched it. And we then found that the rudder remained at full starboard, even though the radio control was commanding a centralised rudder. Later on, when we turned the radio control on again in this section here, about 11.42, 43, um, we got all kinds of odd PWM signals, such as this one here at 135, which is, it should, this f signal should be between plus and minus 50 degrees, and it's enormously too high. And we also noticed on the deck camera that although the yellow telltale uh, arrow seemed to be moving, the red arrow, which tells us the actual position of the rudder itself, was not moving. So I've moved the boat into my hall so that I can examine this problem with the rudder. Um, when I got it home after our last trip to Southampton Water, there was at most two tiny drops of water inside the hull, so there was no water problem below decks. And there was no water in the electronics box and no water in the radio control box. What there was, was a Futaba connector here, which was uh, severely corroded. So, there appears to be a fair amount of corrosion on the input to that Futaba connector there, and also on the other side. And that's what the inside of the Futaba connector looks like. Um, but as this server was in fact working perfectly all the time, I don't think that's particularly relevant. Um, the problem that we had in, in, in the sea was that for a period of time the radio control did not seem to be effective in controlling the rudder. Uh, what we observed was that uh, when we operated the radio control, this telltale servo with the yellow uh, arrow on it was working in response to our commands but this one which shows the actual position of the rudder was not moving so the radio control seemed to be able to control this servo but not the actual linear actuator which controls the rudder whereas when it was being when the rudder was being controlled by the autopilot, both of these were working in sync with one another. Now, uh, the odd thing about that is that these two servers are actually electrically in parallel. So, in theory, either both of them should work or neither of them should work. So, the, the only sort of kind of remaining explanation that one might have for this peculiar behaviour is that perhaps the signal from the radio control is slightly defective in such a way that it uh, is not suitable for the actual rudder servo uh, under the deck, but it still manages to operate this servo. Um, so I was going to look at the waveforms to see if I could see anything like that. Of course the problem is that now it's all working perfectly anyway, so I can't reproduce the actual conditions that we had at sea. I've got the, uh, the rudder being driven by the autopilot at the moment, in other words the radio control is off. So this is a signal coming out of the micromite, and 
you can see it is 50 Hertz frequency and the pulse width here is one and a half milliseconds and the signal is running between naught and just over three volts. If we turn on the radio control that's the radio control signal which is very similar except its frequency is 45 Hertz the pulse width is still one and a half milliseconds and the signal is going between 0.3 and 3 volts. And then if I use the joystick on the radio control to uh, move the rudder to, to fully to port, the pulse width goes down to 1.1 milliseconds. And if I move it fully to starboard, it goes up to 1.9 milliseconds. That's all exactly the same as the autopilot, except for this 0.3 millimeter, 0.3 volt uh, beta floor voltage, which is slightly more than zero. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything at all defective about that. Well, these results have uh, caused me to go back to the drawing board and think that possibly this corrosion in the Futaba connector, just after it had been doused in seawater, uh, may be the clue to the problem. So what we've got to look at is what is the effect of dowsing a Futaba connector in seawater. So according to the internet the resistivity of seawater is 20 ohms a centimetre. Now Let's suppose, and the, the formula for resistance of something is the, the length times the resistivity over the cross-sectional area. Let's suppose that uh, the cross-sectional area is uh, 0.2 centimetres by 0.2 centimetres. That's you know, 2 millimetres by 2 millimetres. So, so A equals 0.2 times 0.2 and the separation of the contacts is uh, one millimeter let's say 0.1 centimeters so that gives r equals 0.1 times 20 over 0.2 times 0.2 which equals what 0.1 20 0.2 div 0.2 div that equals 50 ohms, 50 ohms. So at five, uh, well let's say at three volts, three over 50 equals, equals 60 milliamps. So even with the three volt PWM signal, uh, 60 milliamps could flow from the PWM uh, contact to the earth contact. That's not counting the current that could flow from the 5 volt contact to either of these two. On this Futaba connector we've got a ground wire, a plus 5 volt wire and the PWM signal. And I just wondered how much current will flow if we put this into a cup of water into which I put about a tablespoon of uh, salt. We turn it on, obviously we get no current at all at the moment. And we get 66 milliamps when it's wet, passing between the two. So that is very useful. So I think uh, the explanation is that if you douse the Futaba connector in seawater then it's either going to short circuit the PWM signal to ground or it's going to apply plus 5 volts to the PWM signal thus making it appear to be hard to starboard regardless of what the radio control is doing. And probably the assumption that I made earlier that uh, the autopilot could still successfully control the rudder was probably untrue. Probably once the connector had been doused in seawater for the next few minutes until it dried out a little bit, um, nobody could control the rudder. Um, 
I, I had kind of thought, well, uh, this yellow servo is only for test purposes anyway, and uh, this is all low voltage electronics. Who cares if there's a bit of water on it? And that was a big mistake. Uh, I had forgotten that the resistivity of seawater is 900,000 times less than the resistivity of tap water. So that even at 3 volts, it conducts a significant current. So that's an important lesson. We've got to waterproof everything, um, even when it's just for test purposes. Well, it's the next morning uh, after I filmed that stuff yesterday about the rudder. Uh, one other point. Uh, if it was the case that the autopilot seemed better able to control the rudder uh, than the radio control um, when in the presence of this seawater, that could well be because the micromite is capable of sinking and sourcing a higher current than perhaps the uh, RC receiver is uh, capable of doing. I don't have the spec of the, re the RC control. Um, I do have the spec of the micromite, so that's a possibility which would give the AP an edge in controlling a slightly short-circuited PWM uh, signal. Another problem we had at Weston was uh, with the uh, auto jibe. Um, the auto jibe is a feature whereby if we've got applied full rudder in one direction and the boat hasn't responded within 20 seconds then we apply full rudder in the opposite direction in the hope that that might work. It's a kind of tactic that the helmsman uses when he's having difficulty. Uh, when it's auto jibing the uh, circles are in cyan. Um, so you can see we were doing quite a lot of auto jibes and not all of them succeeded in turning the boat round. Sometimes this was because it was simply not possible to turn the boat either start to starboard or to port uh, uh, in the face of uh, a, a broadside on wind. But in other cases, um, the auto jibe failed for an interesting reason, which I will now show you. Here we are broadside on to the wind and the navigator has set a course of 28 degrees, so we want to turn through 90 degrees away from the wind. So um, the helmsman has set full starboard rudder to achieve that. But uh, nothing happens. The boat continues uh, at uh, broadside on to the wind, being held there by a weather helm, essentially. If I let this go, um, what happens is, so after 20 seconds, the auto jibe comes into effect and it spends 10 seconds with a centralized rudder in the hope of increasing the boat speed, which at the moment is 0.35 mph. So let's just run it until the end of the um, centralized rudder section. So now at the end of the centralized rudder section, the speed is picked up a little bit to 0.49 mph and uh, the auto jibe logic applies full port rudder so having failed to turn clockwise in what looks a really simple manoeuvre, we're now going to attempt the uh, more difficult manoeuvre of turning through the wind round this way. And of course what actually happens is, is it doesn't work and it spends a lot of time trying to turn through the wind but not succeeding. Meanwhile being blown sideways uh, roughly on the course we actually want, but we don't actually intend to sail the boat sideways all the time. It's a highly inefficient way of sailing. So this goes on for a long time um, because there's nothing in the auto jibe logic to terminate it if it's not working. It just sticks there. So basically we're waiting for a fortuitous event uh, to get us out of this situation. And what would be a useful fortuitous event is if the wind were to veer more northerly at the same time as the boat fortuitously by the waves was uh, moved to port uh, it might just turn through the wind and then it could continue turning under its own control. So here the wind has just veered a bit in a northerly direction and the boat has shifted fortuitously to port 
and now we've actually turned through the wind so hopefully if we let this run on we'll see that the boat will continue to turn as it does here. So at this point the auto jibe logic uh, decides that it has achieved its aim so it turns itself off and we go back to the ordinary helmsman uh, steering uh, which decides still to apply full port rudder because the boat is pointing south and we want it to point at 30 degrees so it's uh, got to turn through quite a large angle so it still applies full port rudder Meanwhile the speed is picked up to 1 mph and after a short while the boat resumes its turn So now it's pointing in the right direction but we've still got a large port rudder on let that go a bit more. So now it's, it's overshot its target of 28 degrees and is rotated through further on. The helmsman now begins to apply starboard rudder in the hope of bringing it back but is there so much uh, angular momentum in the, the boat that it just continues on so now we've got back to exactly the position we were at the beginning of this auto jibe whole process where we're pointing in the wrong direction. So we've overshot our objective. What should have happened is that when the boat was pointing about here and beginning to turn we should have taken off the uh, port rudder in the hope of slowing it down pointing it the right direction. But we didn't do that for two reasons and I'll just go back here. At this point here because because the boat has spent such a long time pointing in entirely the wrong direction the integral component of the PID controller proportional integral derivative the integral component has risen to its maximum possible value of minus 90 degrees and this has the effect of uh, forcing the rudder to stay at its uh, maximum uh, on full uh, port even as the boat approaches the right heading and that integral component doesn't go off until we actually turn through the desired heading. At that point there we turn through the desired heading and that uh, what the algorithm actually zeroes the integral component at that point but it's too late we've already swung far too fast. So that's one reason and probably we should just turn off the integral component entirely when we're in auto jibe because auto jibe is just holding a full port or full starboard rudder regardless of uh, what's happening. The second reason this didn't turn off full port rudder quickly enough is because uh, we don't have a derivative element in the PID controller at the moment. The derivative element is zero um, and this boat is turning very rapidly in an anti-clockwise direction. If we had a derivative component it would have the effect of taking off that full port rudder much more quickly and that's what we have now coded uh, into the uh, helmsman um, for the next test. So those are a couple of the things that we've learned from the somewhat disastrous test at Weston. Um, Dick has invented a new generic mission which should help us in the next test that we want to do because we need to test um, a lot of tacking upwind and uh, running downwind and turning between those two uh, courses. Uh, so um, whereas all our existing missions have had fixed waypoints de devised in advance from Google Earth uh, the new generic mission uh, programs itself when we turn the boat on 
So it records where it is when we power the boat up, and it records that as the home waypoint, and it then measures the wind direction, and it uh, establishes a, an away waypoint, which is 100 metres away, upwind from wherever it is, and it then sails between those two points, um, hopefully. Uh, so that means that wherever we are on the lake or on the seashore and whatever the wind direction is, the mission will involve attacking directly upwind, uh, turning round and uh, running directly downwind. And these are the things that we need to practice. So that's what we'll be doing in future tests. Thanks very much for watching.